From May 12 to 15, 2014, the Institute of Adventist Studies organized an academic symposium in Friedenzau, Germany, in which 19 internationally known researchers took part in a discussion regarding the impact of the First World War on the Seventh-day Adventist Church. After receiving a circular letter from a German member of the Reform Movement announcing the seminar, which would cover topics of World War I and the origin of the Reform Movement, it was deemed appropriate that two members of the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church Reform Movement, International Missionary Society, be present at the meeting. A request submitted to the organizers of the gathering was granted, and the Reform Movement was given the opportunity to present its point of view on World War I and its consequences. Brothers Idel Suarez Jr. and Woon Sang Kang, President and Second Secretary of the General Conference respectively, were among the speakers and also took part in the discussions. Twenty-nine minutes were given to each lecturer, followed by fifteen minutes of question and discussion from the inner circle. On occasion, participation from the outer circle was also granted. On Wednesday evening, May 14th, the university scheduled presentations for the reform movement. The same 29 minutes per presenter were granted, but this time there was no separation of inner and outer circle. Rather, everyone had the opportunity to ask the reform movement questions. The university took advantage of this special moment to present an official declaration prepared by the two German unions. Here, referring to the events of World War I, they admit that advice contradicting the Word of God was given, which led to division and profound hurt. They also recognized that church leadership during that time unjustly accused members who contradicted them of having fallen from the truth, and in individual cases, went as far as having people pursued by the authorities. Therefore, directing themselves to the descendants and relatives of those affected, and to the reform movement in general, they write, we ask for forgiveness for our failings, having learned that the children of God are called to be people of peace, and to reject every form of violence against the innocent. Given this context, we present the Reform Movement's participation at this symposium, in which was delineated the nonviolent and pacifist position that Christians should hold both in time of peace and time of war. The express wish is that this subject may be deeply considered among the Adventist Church worldwide. Und es ist eine besondere Ehre, dass wir jetzt einen Generalkonferenzpräsidenten bei uns haben, der zu uns redet. And it's a special privilege to have a president of the General Conference among our heads to speak to us. Wir heißen ganz herzlich Bruder Suarez. Willkommen bei uns. Brother Suarez is very welcome to us. Er wird jetzt ein äh, Paper präsentieren, sein Paper unter dem Titel äh, Die Reformbewegung aus der Perspektive von 1914 und die Perspektive der Reformbewegung im Blick auf das Jahr 1914. Und wir sind ganz begierig zu hören, was er uns sagen wird. Und wir sind sehr begierig zu hören, was wir uns sagen werden. Und wir hoffen, dass wir mit offenen Ohren, mit offenen Augen zuhören können, auch einander zu verstehen. And uh, let's open our ears and listen to each other carefully. Uh, please, brother. It's your time. You have a paper those of the inner circle, and I have just summarized it in a PowerPoint format, and I've also made a summary as an appendix to the paper that you can pick up. The title of this paper is The Reform Movement Perspective on 1914, and the theme text is taken from John chapter 18, verse 36, and it says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. I want to thank Dr. Rolf 
Poehler and his committee for including Dr. Woon Sang Kang and myself in this symposium, and the Frieden Saw Adventist University for allowing our pioneers to have a voice back in 1920 and now in 2014. The theme of this paper is the following. There exists a striking parallel with the beginning of the gospel work of Jesus, the reformation of Luther, the Adventist movement of 1844, and the reform movement of 1914. When we go to the great controversy, and I will be quoting from the great controversy, the 1888 version, it says, the work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past, and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. And so I wish to compare those principles and show the striking similarities in several reformatory movements. Let us go back to Gamaliel. The Bible says that he stood before the Sanhedrin and spoke and recalled that there was a Thudius who was slain and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. He also mentioned a Judas of Galilee that drew away much people after him and he also perished and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. Gamaliel said, if this movement is not of God, it will disappear, referring to the disciples of Jesus. If it is of God, you cannot fight against it. Right here, in Friedensau, in 1920, 16 reformers and one interpreter met with four officers of the General Conference. The protocol or the minutes are found in your library in Friedensau. And another Gamaliel stood up. His name was A.G. Daniels. And he compared the opposition movement to the messenger party of Sister White's days that came to naught. And he made the following declaration, which is recorded by ruling in his protocol. I know exactly this morning what the result of this course will be after 10 years, if the Lord has not come by then. Finally, the whole thing will be dispersed like the water in the sand. Nearly a hundred years have gone by, and this reform movement today is in over 120 countries. Caiaphas, the high priest, had a fear that he shared in the Sanhedrin, he said, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Caiaphas, the high priest, feared that if the doctrine of Christ were to be accepted, they would lose their temple, they would lose their nation. Pilate also had a fear. We read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hand before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. We know from the writings of Sister White that Pilate feared losing his position and honor, the honor he had before the Roman Empire. And it says, rather than lose his worldly power, he chose to sacrifice an innocent life. How many, to escape loss of suffering, in like manner sacrifice principle, conscience and duty point one way, and self-interest points another, and he who compromises 
with evil is swept away into the thick darkness of guilt. We come to the European Division Secretary and his fear, similar to that of Caiaphas, of losing their churches and honor. He wrote to O.A. Tate, who was a administrator, a publishing administrator in the United States, this letter dated October 6, 1914. He says, in Austria, there were a number of Nazarenes who refused to take up arms and they were merely shot, that's all. And I have felt that it is much wiser to go to the field of battle trusting God than to be sent over the border as exiles and traitors of the empire. He didn't want the Seventh-day Adventists young people to be considered traitors. Now we jump to August 2, 1914. That Saturday, Guy Dale issued a letter from Hamburg after meeting, as we have heard in the papers that have been presented with about 40 people in Hamburg. And he said, we are to do our military duties cheerfully whilst we are in service, so that the officers in charge will find in us valiant and true soldiers who are ready to die for their homes, for the army, and for our fatherland. Now think for a moment, Seventh-day Adventists in Germany shooting against Seventh-day Adventists in America on the battlefield. Now surprisingly, what a coincidence. Fifty years before, Exactly on the same date, August 2nd, the General Conference Committee of the Seventh-day Adventists issued a letter that sounds like conscientious objection. It was issued on August 2, 1864. But 50 years later, on August 2nd, 1914, the letter, without a doubt, is a combatant letter encouraging participation in war. The General Conference Committee with Byington, Loughborough, and Amadon said the following, Seventh-day Adventists are conscientiously opposed to bearing arms. The fourth requires cessation from labor on the seventh day, and the sixth prohibits the taking of life, neither of which could be observed while doing military duty. They compiled the letters that were sent to at least four, if not five, governors in the United States, and repeatedly they emphasized, we are conscientiously opposed to bearing arms, to engaging in war, to human bloodshed. Now, they, some compared these new Seventh-day Adventists to the Quakers, the Society of Friends, who during the Revolutionary War in the United States were conscientious objectors. During the Civil War, they were also conscientious objectors, pacifists. When we return to the days of Jesus, the people called for Caesar. The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. They wanted Pilate to be Caesar's friend. And it is interesting that not only letters were issued by the leaders here in Germany, but entire delegations in more than 10 occasions, as was reported in the Zion Wachter, in Germany and in Romania, issued the following statement, almost the same. In the matter of military service and the bearing of arms, we consider this a civil matter which God established governments have a right to require as stated in first of Peter and Romans chapter 13 verse 4 and 5. That was the decision of a delegation, the West German Union. Interestingly, Sister White foretold that that same biblical text would be used during the Sunday law. And when we review her writings, she speaks of the crisis of war, the crisis of the Sunday law, and sometimes it seems that she joins them. This is what she wrote in Testimonies for the Church. 
There is a prospect before us of a continued struggle at the risk of imprisonment, loss of property, even of life itself, to defend the law of God, which is made void by the laws of men. In this situation, worldly policy will urge an outward compliance with the laws of the land. And there are some who will even urge such a course from Scripture. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. That text is Romans chapter 13. At the General Conference session held in San Francisco in 1922, the General Conference Bulletin reported that one of the pastors that spoke said the following, We must render that which is required to the civil government, no matter how unreasonable or onerous it may seem to us, the great breadth of the rule, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, means to submit without protest. Jesus spoke against the commandments of God. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching doctrines and commandments of men. We recall that Jesus told Peter, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. That is a new text. That's not in your paper. But I understand from this verse that Jesus is speaking against a just war. If there would have been a just war, it would have been to defend Jesus. There was war in heaven when the angels defended Michael in heaven, the archangel. And now they sh Peter wanted to defend his master. And Jesus says, no, this is not a just war. You are not to defend me. Martin Luther here in this country of Germany stood up with the protests. And we will see that tomorrow, thanks to the tour. Now, Sister White tells us that indulgences for which Martin protested again, against were also issued for going to war. She says, this was supplied by the doctrine of indulgences, full remission of sins, past, present, and future, and release from all the pains and penalties incurred were promised to all who would enlist in the pontiff's war. Those who participated received an indulgence that they would not receive any punishment or discipline from the church or from God in the case of the Catholic Church. The Waldenses, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, in the beginning resisted all participation in war. They denounced indulgences and considered the shedding of human blood unlawful. They consequently condemned war. Enrique Dussel, in his history of the Latin American, the church in Latin America, states, the clergy issued indulgences to their parishioners to go to war against Spain and to seek independence and to defend their nation and the cause of liberty. They were defending their homes. They were defending their nation. The European leaders, Conradi and Schubert and Drinhaus, also issued another letter on February 22, 1915. And this letter stated, and it was issued because some churches were closed in Dresden, and now they wanted those Adventist churches that were closed to be open. And this is what they conceded. We have advised all their members required to perform military service in all the kingdom to do so on Saturday, Sabbath, as other warriors do on Sunday. They wanted to be like the Sunday keepers in going to war and doing so even on the Sabbath. Christ in the war that was mentioned by um, our dear brother before declared first, that the taking part in war is not transgression of the Sixth Commandment. This was written by Vincent and approved by three Union officers. And second, that doing military service on the Sabbath is not the transgression of the Fourth Commandment. That was in Der Christ und der Krieg. Sister White not only spoke against the war in 1863 
to go against the statements of James White of 1862, Our Nation, but she, after that time, has issued many statements in the spirit of prophecy condemning war. Here is one in Patriots and Prophets. The Eighth Commandment condemns man-stealing, slave-dealing, and forbids wars of conquests. She also wrote in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 6, as trials thicken around us, both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. Some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare will, in times of real peril, yield to temptation. The Great War was a temptation, and they yielded to temptation. But I am encouraged that it says we will see separation and unity. She also wrote in the great controversy, Satan delights in war, for it excites the worst passions of the soul and sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite nations to war against one another. Going back to the days of Christ, there was a blind man that received his vision. Not just his physical vision, but also spiritual vision. And we read when he was brought to the Sanhedrin that the Jews had agreed, if any would confess Christ, that they would be put out of the synagogue. And they said to him, Dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. They expelled him for believing in Christ. Luther was also excommunicated. Here is a copy of the bull that was issued against Martini Luteri, Etse curatium. So all his followers also. Now Sister White writes about this. The Pope had threatened Luther with excommunication if he did not recant. And the threat was now fulfilled. And the door was open so that others that followed him would also be excluded, I may add. We go to the time of the Advent movement in its beginning. The Harmon family which was the family of Ellen White before she married, was also expelled and excommunicated from the Methodist Church. She writes, The next Sunday, the presiding elder read off our names, seven in number. As discontinued from the church, we were expelled on the account of walking contrary to the rules of the Methodist Church. He also declared that the door was now open and all who were guilty of a similar breach of rules would be dealt with in like manner. Oscar Kramer, an eyewitness, writes in several booklets, this one titled My Life. He says about 2,000 to 3,000 believers were expelled during the Great War. They were Seventh-day Adventists pacifists. Who did the pioneer Adventist disfellowship 50 years earlier in 1865? Come with me 50 years earlier from 1915 to the year 1865. And we find this notice and several notices were published in the Review and Herald. And this is the declaration, as voluntary enlistment into the service of war is contrary to the principles of faith and the practice of the Seventh-day Adventists, as contained in the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, they cannot retain those within their communion who so enlist. Enoch Hayes was therefore excluded from the membership of the Battle Creek Church by a unanimous vote of the church. Note the year, 1865, three years after our nation. On August 22, 1914, Oscar Kramer recalls what happened at the Bremen Church. He says that Elder Barr pulled out a paper on which were the names of quite a few of our best members, declaring that they were no longer considered members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our elder, Brother Richter, was the first, or one of the first, to be disfellowshipped. And he mentions other names that are listed in the paper. Members were also disfellowshipped in other churches, 
Stobe, Albert Stobe published in 1915, members are this fellowship that do not wish to fall in line with the new position. He stated the new position. Thus in Cray, the church was dissolved. In Essen and Bremen, members were disfellowshipped. Let's contrast the military position of the Civil War and the Great War. In the Civil War, they were conscientious objectors. In the Great War, they became conscientious cooperators. In the Civil War, they abstained from engaging in war. In the Great War, they became non-combatants and combatants. At the Civil War, they decided to pay $300 rather than join the military. In the Great War, we have evidence that tithes and special offerings were invested in the war effort. In the Civil War, they excluded those members who enlisted in the military. In the Great War, they excluded those who opposed and protested against the war. In the Civil War, they wrote to the government stating that they would not join the military nor go to war. In the Great War, they wrote to the government saying they would go to war and do so even on the Sabbath. In the Civil War, they upheld the fourth six, and we're going to add the eighth commandment. In the Great War, they transgressed the fourth, sixth, and eighth commandment. In the days of Jesus, Judas betrayed Jesus. It was foretold in the Old Testament, Yea, mine own familiar friend whom I have trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. A friend could only come so close to kiss Christ. We have found a list of Adventist church military objectors that were pulled together by the German security police records. Now let me emphasize that there were not only those who later joined the reform movement who declared themselves as pacifists. There were Seventh-day Adventists who declared themselves as pacifists that did not join the reform movement. And there is one case study we could cite, Johannes Rauser. He was baptized in the SDA church in 1910. He was a conscientious objector fugitive for 20 months. Jesus had stated to his disciples, if they persecute you in one city, go to another city. And he used that word in the New Testament many times, flee. He became part of the underground group in Stuttgart. For this, we have police records. He was caught on August 23rd, 1918. An Adventist leader, according to the police records, spoke to him and said, we are looking at it differently now. And this was Emil Google. Here you see his picture. He was a leader in the German Union. Now, Johannes Rauser was sentenced to the Ulm military prison after that court case in which his pastor testified against him. He refused to work on Sabbath in the jail or in the prison, and he was chained to the wall in a dark cellar without toilet rights. By the mercy of God, he was delivered by an amnesty issued by the Kaiser, and he was released on November 10, 1918. His grandson is with us today in this audience. And if you would like to hear more about that story, he has investigated it in depth. We wanted to present something new that would be of interest to the uh, researchers. Now, there were dreamers in the days of Christ. Claudia had a dream, and she sent a message to Pilate, Have thou nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. She was not an open disciple of Christ, according to the evidence we have. But in the days of Luther, they had fanatics also, and people that stirred trouble. And if we go to the days of the Adventists, there were dreamers in the early Advent movement, and there were fanatics that Ellen G. White had to 
stand up against, and she writes in the great controversy, the fact that a few fanatics work their way into the ranks of Adventists is no more a reason to decide that the movement was not of God than was the presence of fanatics and deceivers in the Church of Paul's or Luther's day a sufficient excuse for condemning their work. Johann Wick was first presented by Conradi here in Friedensau. It has been repeated by other Adventist writing, such as Christian and others, and even Schwartz in his history of the Advent movement. But our pioneers all testify that he was never part of the Reform movement. Their views were not endorsed by the pioneer leaders in the Reform, Kramer declared, and even in the protocol that's here in Friedensau, Deutschler told Daniels that he, Wick, did not belong to his movement, to this movement. Other names were mentioned that they did say, yes, they did believe they were members of this movement, but they were disfellowshipped from this movement. Jesus expanded the law. We know this text as Adventists. We cite it to our Protestant brethren that Jesus did not come to destroy the law. The closing words that Frieden saw were quoted by Deutschler to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this, it is because there is no light in them. The last published work of Ellen G. White was the Prophets and Kings that she wrote from beginning to end, and it states the remnant people, God's remnant people, standing before the world as reformers are to show that the law of God is the foundation of all enduring reform, and that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is to stand as a memorial of creation, a constant reminder of the power of God. In clear, distinct lines, they are to present the necessity of obedience to all the precepts of the Decalogue. Constrained by the love of Christ, they are to cooperate with him in building up the waste places. Sister White says that if we are to be reformers, we need to follow the foundation of the law of God. We are to be constrained by the love of Christ. There is a striking parallel between Jesus, Luther, and the Adventist movement and the reform movement of 1914. Jesus and the whites proclaimed peace and nonviolence. Reformers advocated nonviolence. Jesus and Luther protested against the commandments of God. So did many reformers and Adventists protest against the mandates to go to war. Luther and the whites were expelled from their churches as the disciples of Jesus were also. And reformers had to endure being expelled. Luther and the whites were called fanatics and dreamers. And so were also the reformers as timesetters and fanatics. Jesus expanded the law and the reformers for 100 years have maintained a pacifist position. What did the reformers learn from the Great War? Reformers learn that you do not need to compromise the truth, and yet the movement can survive. May his mercy be extended to every faithful Adventist that follows the teachings of Jesus, of pacifism, of nonviolence, of conscientious objection. Thank you very much, and in the words of John Calvin, Solo Deus Gloria, all glory be to God. We want to honor those who were faithful in war for Jesus. Amen. Thank you.